So the second third, I'll talk about these things called doubly Hurwitz or maximal Vogel groups. So roughly speaking, phrased a bit differently, this will be discussing work of my former PhD student, Emilio Piero, uh, now at the London School of Economics. If you're looking for a future seminar speaker, you could do a lot worse than invite him. Mm -hmm. um, finally, in the last third, talk about generalizations. Uh, so the clue is in the name, Vogel surfaces, are very sort of two dimensional things, which raises questions of what happens in higher dimensions. And uh, my current PhD student, Lodo Carta, has done some impressive computations that uh, push things just that little bit further. We'll hopefully talk about then. Okay, so the preliminaries. Okay, this is a slide to forget. I've only included this definition as a sort of background motivation. The bulk of what I'm about to put here, we will not mention again and is not needed. The take home message from this slide is, we start with a finite group and we have an act on a pair of Riemann surfaces in a particularly nice way. If you just keep that in mind, you're fine for the rest of the book. But what do I mean a bit more specifically? So I say you can largely forget this. So definition to Fabrizio Catanese back in 2000. So a complex surface S is a Bovel surface if S can be viewed as R1 cross R2 quotient by G, where the Ri is a complex algebraic curves, in other words, Riemann surfaces of genus at least two, where G is a finite group acting faithfully on each of the Ri's by holomorphic transformations, and more to the point, the G is acting freely on the R1 cross R2. So in particular, the only thing that fixes anything at all is the identity element. And more to the point, well, no, not quite, each Ri quotient G, you know, that quotient map onto um, the sphere or a fancier name for it, the complex projective line P1 of C, and the corresponding covering maps are ramified over three points. So basically it goes wrong at worst with most three points. The reason for liking this sort of thing was that a theorem of Bailey from the 1970s told us the only way you could have a function that looks like this is if your Riemann surface is a particularly nice form. In other words, corresponds to a polynomial whose coefficients belong to a number field. So yeah, it's a particularly nice kind of surface, at least if you're a geometer. If th this means nothing to you, don't worry. We'll barely make any reference to this in what follows. Um, a slightly different way of thinking about this. So half the point of being ramified over three points or at most three points um, is phrased a bit differently in terms of the theory of Dezins d'Enfant. You can think of this as being a pair of orientably regular hypermaps, if I'm getting all the adjectives right there, um, with a certain disjointness condition. Now, as I say, most of this definition, not going to mention or see again. What makes anybody care about objects satisfying such a, a weird and bizarre um, definition? Well, it turns out that being defined using a finite group means that actually most of the definition boils down to playing inside the group. And as a consequence, because dealing with little finite groups is much easier than dealing with hideously complicated complex geometric objects, we're able to prove that these things have a number of really nice properties. Okay, so they're supposedly surfaces of general type. So it's certainly the 19th century Italian school of algebraic geometry, there's you know, a certain classification of the different kinds of surfaces you might have out there. And general type just means, you know, the really nice, broadly speaking, sensible ones you'd think of. Um, there is a technical definition in terms of something called a Codera dimension. But again, this is not a geometry talk, so let's not go into that. Um, they're rigid in the sense of emitting no non-trivial deformations. So again, a really nice property for things to have. Uh, yeah, it turns out their automorphism groups are actually not too difficult to write down either. So I mentioned that these two Riemann surfaces and then we've got these three ramification points in each. So it turns out the worst that can happen is you might have a symmetric group S3 permuting those ramification points in the first surface. You might have an S3 permuting the three ramification points in the second um, Riemann surface. There's a possibility you can swap the two over. So it's like an S3 wreath S2. And apart from that, the only interesting things that can happen come from the center of the group. So in particular, you're definitely looking at something that's soluble, it's definitely finite, it's definitely not very interesting in effect. Um, so unlike most things, the automorphism groups of these objects are fairly easy to write down. Their fundamental groups can also be determined without too much difficulty. Um, you're warned once you've obtained it, you might regret having done so. So the sort of simplest example of this 
if I've got the finite group, that's the elementary abelian group of order 25. So if, if I've got C5 cross C5 from the group, I obtain the Boval surface. Once I have the Boval surface, I determine its fundamental group. And well, despite the elementary abelian group of order 25 being a really nice, small, easy to deal with object, the fundamental group of the corresponding surface the, the nicest presentation we're aware of has 76 generators and 250 relations. You know, it's a horrible mess, but you can at least explicitly write it down. So the fundamental group can be obtained without too much difficulty, though you might regret having tried to do so. And as I say, what makes these things have all these nice properties means that, you know, because they're so easy to deal with and it's so easy to obtain these nice properties, you know, they're, they're nice sort of things to play around with if you have some conjecture about complex surfaces, if you have some um, idea as to what you think might be true, a good way of testing it is to think about if it holds for these objects. Um, there certainly have been conjectures in the past where the easiest counterexamples obtained were actually things of this form. So geometers like these, and they're certainly nice to think about and worth um, looking at. Right, so as I say, Definition of a surface, forget it. Why forget it? Because the whole thing internalized in that group. So as I say, the surface comes from letting a finite group act on a pair of um, complex curves or Riemann surfaces you prefer. If we ignore the curves, you can instead think of it solely coming from the following. So if G is a finite group, then given two elements X and Y, I define this beast. Okay, so if this was a talk being given in a conventional way with a, a blackboard or a whiteboard, and I was physically standing in front of you, this is the thing I would write on the board and deliberately leave it there for the whole of the rest of the talk, because these sigma sets, as I would call them, they come back to haunt us quite a lot. So roughly speaking, what have we got here? So sigma of X and Y, I care about not just X and Y, it being a group, there's naturally a way of multiplying things together. So I care about X and Y and their product. In particular, I care about not just those elements, but all the powers of those elements. And more to the point, I care about which conjugacy classes they land in. Okay, so thinking in terms of the surfaces I've just told you to forget, as I say, we have these three ramification points. You're meant to think of the X, the Y, and their product as corresponding to each of those ramification points in some sense, and what really dictates how they behave which conjugacy classes we bump into. So this sigma xy is sort of how the group sees one of those um, complex curves. So a Boval structure of G is when I've got, it's really two pairs rather than four elements, but an x1, y1, and an x2, y2, with the property that the pairs generate the group. So they really are taking into account everything the group is, everything the group can do, can see the whole business straight away. And more to the point, their corresponding sigma sets have trivial intersection. So this is really what gives us the rigidity of the corresponding surface, because any non-trivial stuff in that intersection allows us some wiggle room that would allow the thing to not be rigid. So having these things so disjoint, they only have the identity in, column, in common, that tells you that, yeah, we are genuinely dealing with a surface that's nice and rigid. So if our group has a Boval structure, we call it a Boval group. And more to the point, the type of the structure are these the orders of the XIs, YIs, and their product. Okay, so very often if you've got a group and you've got um, a couple of generating pairs and you want to check whether or not you're dealing with a Boval structure, in other words, if you want to check that those sigma sets genuinely have this disjointness property, the easiest way of showing that is usually to find that the orders of X1, Y1, and their product, those guys have orders that are co prime to X2, Y2, and their product. Because after all, if there was something that lay in a, if there was a conjugacy class in common, then that would have an order that would divide the, you know, the things, both of these things. Whereas if the orders of the elements, etc., are all co-prime, then we definitely have those sigma sets not intersecting. It's not always possible to do that, but it is a useful trick that's sometimes helpful. Um, it's also worth noting that this information alone. Um, is actually enough to give us some properties about the surface as well. So from these numbers, you can calculate things like its genus. Um, so, you know, from a geometric point of view, it's worth keeping tabs on the type, as well as from trying to verify our group as a Boval group. 
Okay, if that was really confusing you, let's get explicit for a moment. Just to really hammer home what this definition is, here's an explicit example. So if I think about the alternating group A7, so the group of all even permutations of seven objects, one possible Bobel structure comes from the following. So if I take x1 to be the seven cycle, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I take y1 to be the five cycle, two, three, four, five, six, Okay, well, you can easily verify, you know, put pen to paper or plug it into a computer. And their product is also this seven cycle. So one, three, five, two, four, six, seven. If I want a second pair to genuinely pad this thing. Oh, hello. Is that a question? No, there is no question, actually. Uh, okay. I... Okay, we're carrying on then. Um, so to pad this out to a full-blown Bovel structure, I want a second generating pair. So let's take x2 to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And I take y2 to be 1, 2, 6, 7, 3, 4. Then again, you can just plug it into a computer or put pen to paper and you find that x2, y2 is 1, 6, 2, 4, 5, 3. Okay, so without too much difficulty, you can you know, verify these guys generate. So certainly x1 and y1 is quite easy because there's no proper subgroup as elements of order 7 and 5. Um, the x2, y2 is a bit more work, but you can, you know, uh, playing around with conjugates of these things and so on, you can verify that you are dealing with a transitive group. Well, seven points, that means a primitive group. And well, x2 squared gives a three cycle, primitive group with a three cycle in it, it must be the whole thing. Um, so certainly the first condition for being a Bovel structure is met. And from the type, again, this is one reason why liking the type is such a good thing, because the type of this would be 757644. Uh, four. We'll notice that 7 and 5 are co-primed to 6 and 4. So that alone tells you that the intersections must be trivial. If you really wanted to sit down and verify at great length, you could actually explicitly write down the sets of all the elements and verify there's nothing in both of them. But once you know the orders, that's pretty much automatic and there's no problem. Okay, well, A7, as interesting as it is, it's just one of many, many, many known examples. So pretty much my first sojourn into this area was what I like to think of as the Garion, Lost and the Botsky, Grounding, Marla, Busterius, Dr. F. Magard, Parker. Okay, so an early conjecture in the area, which of the finite simple groups are Bovel groups, because um, one of the surprise consequences of the classification of the finite simple groups was verifying that they can all be generated by some pair of elements, and that makes them natural candidates for um, possible things to be Bovel groups. And you can convince yourself that A5 can't possibly be a Bovel group, because any time you have a generating pair, the corresponding sigma set has to contain all the elements of order 5. So in particular, the intersection of any two sigma sets must contain all the elements of order 5, and in particular, can't be just the trivial element. And so you can't possibly get a Bovel structure. But that's the only exception. All the bigger ones definitely do cooperate. Um, why have I got three groups of names? Well, basically three sets of people cottoned on to this problem at the same time. And we all arrived at very similar solutions at about the same time, hence the range of dates. And luckily all of our work was, um, was published. I mean, there were subtle differences. So what Gary and Larson and Lobotsky did was really a probabilistic approach that actually only verified this for all sufficiently large groups, but you know, that's very close to being the full answer. Guralnik and Mahler literally proved the theorem on the board now. Whereas the paper by the last three authors actually verified a slight generalization of this. Um, instead of simple groups, so called quasi simple or quasi simple, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on, um, we'd have to add to the list of exceptions you know, a certain covering group of A5 as well as A5 itself. But basically, this statement um, is correct if we replace simple with quasi simple. Okay. What else is that? Okay. So in Catanese's original paper in 2000, he got interested in finding examples. Well, if you're not a group theorist, like if you are Fabrizio Catanese, you're an algebraic geometer, then the easiest finite groups to deal with are, of course, abelian groups. And he thought, well, can I write down some abelian examples? And it turned out he could. A few years later, Ingrid Bauer, Fabrizio Catanese, and Fritz Grunwald, this sort of big, big paper in 2004, where most of the problems in the area were sort of written down and stated, they actually managed to verify that Catanese's list not only was correct, but actually was exhaustive. It consisted of all the finite abelian, the abelian groups that are bovel groups. 
So in particular, what was proved? Well, if G is a finite abelian group, then G is a Bovel group if and only if G is the direct product of two cyclic groups of order N, where N is strictly greater than one and is co-prime to six. So notice in particular, the smallest value of N that works is N equals five. Hence my earlier reference to the group, the elementary abelian group of order 25, C5 cross C5. That was actually the earliest known example. Um, so you'll notice I've nowhere written the name Bovel on the board yet with anything ascribed to Bovel. What got Catanese interested in the first place was Bovel wrote this wonderful textbook in the 1970s and literally one exercise it, towards the end of the very last chapter of the entire book, he discusses the example of C5 cross C5 and just casually throw it there the question of, well, you know, look at other examples. And what led Catanese to write down the most fully general definition was trying to extend the C5 cross C5 example. Um, hence, his immediate thought might be, well, to write down a, um, a list of groups like this one. OK. Um, yeah, so just to verify, there's stuff in between as well. Um, the symmetric groups, it turns out, if you're at least S5 or bigger, you're also a Bovel group. Um, a result due to Yolanda Fuertes and Camino de Dalas from 2009. And yeah, okay, so P groups stand out as being particularly interesting. So a group whose order is a power of a prime number. Um, looking back to that theorem in the middle of the board about the abelian groups, if I let P be a prime bigger than three, and I let N be any power of that prime, then this theorem on the abelian groups gives you infinitely many examples of Bovel P groups. But that immediately raises the question, well, what about non-abelian examples? What if P equals two? What if P equals three? Because the orders of these things are all of a very restricted form. So P to the N, what, how does this behave as N tends to infinity or as P tends to infinity? Um, note also that addressing questions of Bovel P groups is harder than usual because the type is just going to consist of a bunch of powers of P. So suddenly the intersection thing that works so well with A7 completely breaks down in this case. And as a result, this particular case of thinking about Bovel P groups is sufficiently interesting that lots of different people have focused on this. There have been tons of papers constructing various families of these things, showing their various different properties. And this list of names here, it's not even exhaustive. It's just the first few that sprang to mind when I had to briefly name drop Bovel P groups. Okay. I guess that's a convenient place to pause if there are any questions. Okay, I guess you're all happy. So, so brief digression on what Hurwitz groups are. Okay, so bearing in mind the geometric definition I asked you to forget, the take home message was I got a group acting on um, these complex curves, also known as Riemann surfaces. Well, that raises the question of, well, hang on, what if I forget the Bovel constructions for a moment and I just think about groups acting on Riemann surfaces? What's known about that? So it turns out that if R is a compact Riemann surface of genus at least two, then thinking about groups acting on these things go back quite far. So as long ago as 1878, Schwarz managed to prove that the automorphism group of a compact Riemann surface of genus at least two is in fact finite. Now, this is a theorem that everybody forgets, and this name certainly isn't generally that well known, largely because barely 15 years later, it was overshadowed by a much more interesting theorem of Hurwitz, who managed to verify that the automorphism group is not only finite, but its order is at most g minus one times 84. Moreover, that inequality is an equality, if and only if the automorphism group is two generated and in particular can be generated by an element of order two and an element of order three, such that, such that their product is order seven. So unsurprisingly, such groups are now known as Hurwitz groups. Okay, so given that this particular case, we have equality happening, what if you can't be generated by elements of orders two, three, and seven? Well, roughly speaking, where this sort of theorem comes from is a particular formula in the theory of Riemann surfaces called the riemann hurwitz formula, which basically tries to relate the automorphism group of um, the surface to the genus of the surface and allowing you to calculate one from the other. So, as I said before, this is another reason for caring about the type of a Bovel surface, because in light of this formula, you can obtain the genera of the underlying complex curves, the underlying Riemann surfaces, 
And it turns out if you know those from those, you can calculate the genus of the global surface as a whole. Okay, well, given the above, um, Zvonkin asked, are there boval groups of type 237237? Can we obtain boval structures from a group being a Hurwitz group in two essentially very different ways? Difficult to know. Okay, so I've got a boval group of type 237237. For natural reasons, we call it a doubly Hurwitz boval group. And the first people who really addressed as Vonkin's question with any sort of seriousness was uh, Emeritus Professor Gareth Jones at the University of Southampton and the aforementioned Emilio Piero, who back in 2017 um, thought about this and managed to think about the following. So without going into too much detail, there are reasons for, when thinking about Hurwitz groups, it's natural to focus on simple groups that are Hurwitz. And in particular, it is a sort of ongoing big problem classifying the finite simple Hurwitz groups. So this theorem has got a bunch of groups in it that, you know, they're, they're just special cases of finite simple groups. Okay, so in particular, examples of doubly Hurwitz boval groups include all alternating groups that are sufficiently large, so n is at least 589. The groups PSL n cube, where n is large, at least 631. Um, if you're not for sure what PSL n q is, so SLNQ is n by n matrices whose entries come from the finite field of Q elements such that the determinant is one. PSL is obtained from SL, the special linear group, by quotienting out the center. And it turns out this gives us finite groups the vast majority of the time. Okay, so very large finite simple groups are doubly Hurwitz, oh, doubly with an L, <laughs> first typo, um, Hurwitz boval groups. But it turns out if you look at the smaller ones, you get things that are not doubly Hurwitz. So the sporadic groups. So the classification of the finite simple groups, roughly speaking, says there are 18 well-behaved families of simple groups, and there are 26 exceptions. And those exceptions we call the sporadic groups. Okay, so it turns out though the sporadic groups that are Hurwitz are sufficiently small that they don't cooperate. The same is true of PSL and Q for small n. So despite PSLNQ working for large n, you go down to the bottom and suddenly you're in trouble. And a bunch of other infinite families. If you're not familiar with the classification of the finite simple groups, I don't expect you to know what these are, but bear in mind, there are four other fairly small families, um, or families I should say of groups that are basically nice matrix groups, but on very small matrices, um, yeah. Okay, well, this raises sort of the natural questions, which Hurwitz groups are doubly Hurwitz groups, given that some progress along these lines can be made. So for example, looking at the theorem part A, well, we said the alternating group N is at least 589. Well, that's probably not optimal. The authors admit that, you know, they, they found the best N they could, but they didn't really push the matter very far. It's probable that lower bound can come down a bit. And similarly with PSLNQ, it's very likely you could get N down to some double digit number. Um, but the authors didn't try too hard to optimize that. And as I say, there are numerous other families of simple groups where it's known that there are many members of them that are um, Herbert, but again, open problems yet to be considered. And of course, you know, there are groups out there that are not simple. There are easily sort of extensions of simple groups that could also be considered. But what about those? Well, it's also bearing in mind not every group is a Herbert's group. Um, so if you think back to this riemann Herbert's formula, this is obtained by panicking like mad about um, the surface. So if you're interested in the genus of the surface of R, you ask, what is its automorphism group? Can I find these elements X, Y, and, uh, X, y and their product to do this nice thing? But what if I start at the other end of business? What if I start off with a group and say, I want this to be the automorphism group of some Riemann surface? What's the best I can do in terms of maximizing this genus? Um, you know, do I mean maximize? Well, what if I want to push this genus to an extreme? What, what's the sort of best possible values for the X, Y and their product I can deal with? Well, in light of the above, that sort of creates an ordering on the triples of integers X, Y and their product in terms of what one over, or the sum of one over each of those values. So we've just seen that two, three, seven is the best you can do, thanks to Hurwitz theorem, 
but what if you're not generated by an element of order two and an element of order three, such that your product is order seven? Well, the next best you can do is hope that there's an element of order two and an element of order three, such that your product is order eight. But what if you can't do either of those things? Well, the next best you could do is find an element of order two and an element of order four, such that your product is order five, and so on. Further down the list, so this list does go on forever, but obviously for a given finite group, there are only so many possible element orders you could have. And so in particular, a given finite group could only go so far down the list. The, the real question is how far down? Okay, so in light of this, so Tom Tucker in the 1970s, um, though even earlier than this, there is some evidence to say the, the great William Burnside thought about this in his famous book. Um, so if G is a finite group, then the strong symmetric genus of G is the smallest genus of a Riemann surface that G can act on. So in other words, is the genus corresponding to how small the value um, of that funny number is, can be of all possible generating pairs of it. So if you like, it's sort of a gauge of how far up that list of triples and numbers you can go. So there's plenty of ways a group can fail to be Hurwitz. Um, so, for example, you can verify that these groups have to be perfect. It has to be possible to generate them with their commutators. And that's one reason for liking the finite simple groups so much. But in particular, any group that's not, like symmetric groups, for example, um, yeah, they can't possibly be Hurwitz, never are. Or even better still, you know, if, if your order of your group is such that you couldn't possibly contain elements of orders two, three, and seven, then, well, you couldn't possibly have generators that make you herbits. So there are various ways to fail to be herbits. And so this strong symmetric genus thing, this gauge of how close to being herbits you are is an interesting thing to think about. So in light of this, the mysterious Dr. F um, tried to generalize the notion of a doubly herbits bovel group by thinking about doubly maximal bovel groups. So these are bovel groups where the type isn't 237237, two, seven, but the triple that gives you um, gets you as close to being 237 as you possibly can. So what examples do we have? And the sorry answer is not many. Um, so of the various finite simple groups that are known to not be Hurwitz, um, the following are also known to not be doubly maximal. So PSL2Q. So um, I know I addressed PSL and Q when talking about Hurwitz groups, but why do they belong here as well? Okay, well, if P is a prime, then PSL to P to the power of R, well, that'll be Hurwitz if R is the least value such that the order of the group is divisible by two times three times seven. So if the power, of, if the value of Q is sufficiently small that you stand a, a chance of being Hurwitz, then you are Hurwitz. But for every other power of P, you're not Hurwitz. So for a given prime number, infinitely many of these fail to be Herbits. But it happens that this group, again, it's so small, there's such a narrow range of cyclic groups contained inside the group that your sigma sets are always forced to have a non-trivial intersection. So you can't possibly be um, a bovel group um, whose type corresponds to strong symmetric genus. Twisted B2 type, uh, another, again, I don't expect you to know what these are, but another one of those sort of infinite families with funny names that, you know, in this case, it turns out that they're all two, four, five generated, and there's only one class of elements of order two. So the sigma sets, again, can't have an intersection. So again, the sporadic groups. So these 26 exceptions that don't belong in any infinite family, about half of them are known to be Hurwitz. The other half are known to not be Hurwitz. And most of those, it turns out, again, the lack of conjugacy classes causes problems with one annoying exception. If any of you can show that the baby monster group has a boval structure of type 238238, it would please me enormously. Um, so this is known to not be um, a Hovitz group. So the theorem of Rob Wilson back from about 1990 showed that it's not 237 generated, but that it is 238 generated. And we certainly have some triples of elements of orders two, three, and eight that work, but in every case, the, the threes all come from the same class. So I don't quite know enough to verify whether or not this is a, um, a group that's doubly maximal. Um, again, this is a special case, the more general question of which non hervitz groups are doubly maximal. Answers in a postcard, please. Okay, I guess that's a sense to pause for questions again.
take it from your silence, you're either all bored to death or hoping. Okay. <laughs> Actually, uh, the only question that I have is that uh, there were some bounds, as I saw some numbers. Are these calculated using a specific uh, package or uh, is it really by hand, these calculations? Oh, I mean, you know, calculating a half plus a third plus an eighth gives you 0 0.9583 recurring is something you could do in any calculator. And a half plus a quarter plus a fifth is 0 0.95 you can do in any calculator, etc. There's no any involvement for the class for, for, for the results of Piero and uh, the other person I saw some. Ah, right, Jones and Piero. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I, I mean, if you're going to prove something for infinitely many families clearly a finite computer can only get you so far yes, um, yes. i think for some of those smaller cases so probably the hervitz groups yeah some heroic computation was involved but um no for most of the time a computer is only really so helpful to you yes, yes. thank you okay any more before i plow on again i take by your silence you're utterly lost or born to tears Okay, here's a non-example. I call it a small example, but a small example of what can go wrong in an interesting way. So if you think back to an earlier slide where we talked about the classification of the abelian bobel groups. That said that an abelian group is bobel if and only if it's Cn cross Cn, where n is co-prime to six. Well, if n equals three, then this fails to be bovel for an interesting reason. So just to give names to elements, if I take C3 cross C3 is being generated by X and Y, such that X and Y both have order three and the pair of them commute. And okay, so if you think about it, this is a group of order nine. There's one trivial element, which leaves behind eight other elements that have order three. Well, any element that has order three, it's square will also have order three and in particular, between them, those two elements give you all the element, all the non-trivial elements of a cyclic group of order three. So in particular, this group partitions into, well, the cyclic group generated by X, the cyclic group generated by Y, the cyclic group generated by their product, and the cyclic group generated by their sort of mixed product. So between them, these um, four pairs of elements each consist of the non-trivial elements of a cyclic subgroup of order three. So notice in particular, this extreme lack of cyclic subgroups um, stops this group being a bovel group. However, if we think a bit more carefully about this, we can salvage at least something. So let's think about what the possible sigma sets could actually be corresponding to different generating pairs. So if I look at the sigma set corresponding to X and Y, so I've got X, I've got Y, and I've got their product, so I have got elements from these first three cyclic subgroups, but not the fourth one. If I instead look at X and that twisted, well, that sort of mixed product, so X squared times Y, well, obviously I've got uh, X and its square, I've got X squared Y and its square. The product of these two guys is Y, so I've got Y and its square, which means I've got elements from the first, second and fourth cyclic groups, In its square, I've got xy in its square, but its product, the product, so I've got elements from the first, third, and fourth cyclic subgroups. But finally, if I think about the sigma set corresponding to y and xy, then I've got elements from the second, third, and fourth cyclic subgroups, but not the first one. So, in particular, that means if you pick two of these rows and you look at the corresponding columns, you can guarantee that two of those columns. Uh, solid ticks. You know, the two of these cyclic subgroups will be common to these two sigma sets, no matter which pair you pick. And that's what stops us being a bovel group. However, notice that all four of these columns have an entry that's not got a tick in it. In other words, if I look at the intersection of all four of these guys, that has trivial intersection. Now, as I said earlier, when defining these sigma sets in the first place, the, you know, the first element, the second element, this product, they really correspond to the three ramification points. And that disjointness of the two sigma sets in a bubble group is what gives you rigidity. Well, if I've got four sigma sets lying around, that corresponds to having four Riemann surfaces, four complex curves that my group is acting on. And this trivial intersection 
again means that the, the object obtained by taking the product of these four curves and quotienting out the action of the group, that comes out as being rigid, even though the intersection of two of them is not. So suddenly I'm dealing not really with a, a two-dimensional surface, but with a four-dimensional thing that has oh, a lot of the, pro well, at least some of the properties that the Bogle surface does. It turns out with a bit of thought, you can actually get a lot of the properties that make the surfaces so nice carrying over to this high dimensional thing. Um, so this naturally poses the question, well, if I can do this with the elementary abelian group of order nine, can I do this with other groups as well? Okay, so given the finite group, we say it has Bogle dimension D if, D is the smallest positive integer, such that there exist degenerating pairs of G, such that the corresponding sigma sets have trivial intersection. Um, there's some debate about what to do when there's no such thing. Some would say you just leave the Bogle dimension undefined. Some would say you take the dimension as being one. Some would say dimension to infinity. I don't want to get bogged down in that debate. <laughs> um, let's, not just, let's just not worry about when um, no such D exists. Okay, so as I say, we've got a product of Riemann surfaces lying in the background. This corresponding thing I'll call a generalized Bovel variety. So, you know, these complex curves are really objects in algebraic geometry in some sense. So they do give us varieties. And thinking about the products of these Riemann surfaces, I mean, one thing that makes the world of complex curves and Riemann surfaces so fascinating is that they are, on the one hand, you know, manifolds, but simultaneously sort of varieties. And they kind of simultaneously live in these two worlds. And when I've got the product of lots of these complex curves, I call it a generalized Bovel variety. And as a result, the, the corresponding group I call a generalized Bovel group. So a simple example, any Bovel group um, is a group of Bovel dimension two. And so the corresponding Bovel surfaces are you know, just special cases of generalized Bovel varieties that happen to be surfaces. The example on the previous slide shows us that C3 cross C3 is Bovel dimension four. And if you think about it, I can replace three with any bigger power of three because the elements um, that generate that group will always power up or power down, I suppose, to elements of these cyclic groups of order three. So the obstruction on the previous slide with the four sigma sets um, pairwise not being separate, yeah, you can hit the same problem there. So, so there's infinitely many examples of verbal dimension two and infinitely many verbal dimension four, which sort of raises questions of, well, what else can happen? Um, what other dimensions are possible? Okay, so it kind of just sums up what Ludo, my PhD student, has been doing in his, his thesis. Um, so one thing is achieved is okay, so if we earlier had the classification of the abelian Bovel groups, what can happen more generally? Well, G is an abelian generalized Bovel group, then sadly we don't get dimensions more interesting than two or four, but more specifically, if the dimension is two, well, in other words, it's both a group as we've previously seen, or if the dimension is four, then you have a very restricted form. So G is a generalized both a group, the form uh, CN cross CN cross H, where N is a power of three and H is either the trivial group. So we're straight back to the examples on the previous board or it's an abelian Bovel group. So the problems with the threes that stopped your small number of sigma sets interacting um, stopped having just two sigma sets having trivial intersection, they infect this example as well. And it turns out, you know, this is the best you can do. So if you have an abelian group, either it's not a generalized global group or it's on this list. Um, other things verified. Okay, so proving the above required various subsidiary results. So for example, if I've got two groups of co-prime order and I look at their direct product, then the Bovel dimension of that direct product is going to be the maximum of the Bovel dimensions of the remaining groups, roughly speaking. Um, again, some funny business about what you do if there's no such D, but you know, let's not talk about that. Um, yeah, there's some pretty heroic computations as pushed, you know, having literally considered every group of order N where N is any number up to 1023, if you are familiar with finite groups, you might see why we'd stop at 1023. If you're not, think about the following. So the groups of order at most 2000 have been classified. We've known that for like 20 years or so. And all the groups of order at most 2000 are known. The total number of such groups is about 50,000 million. 
So that's a five with about 10 zeros after it. But out of 50,000 million groups of order at most 2,000, just over 49,500 million of those have order exactly 1,024. In other words, two to the power of 10. So if you're gonna stop anywhere, you stop just shy of two to the power of 10. <laughs> so this is why um, Ludo's computation has gone as far as 1,023. And we do have, you know, several pages long lists of what has global dimensions two and four and so on. Um, on the basis of these computations, we're able to conjecture, you know, various nice families, in fact, have, um, you know, several examples we found we realized fit into more general patterns. So for example, if P is a prime congruent to one mod three, then I can make C3 cross C3 act on the cyclic group of order P, and you know that semi-direct product turns out it's part of a general family. Um, yeah, it turns out there are examples of global dimension three. None of them are very nice. So the smallest examples we found, there are two groups of order three to the power of five. Um, be short of just writing down a strange looking presentation and saying it happens to be this. Uh, there's not much intuitive I could tell you. Um, roughly speaking, what goes on in those examples is the center is you know, C3 cross C3. Your generating sets have to contain elements of order nine. And it turns out the elements of order nine, of course, power up to elements of order three. But of those four cyclic subgroups of order three that lie in the center, it turns out only three of them are powers of elements of order nine. So actually that fourth cyclic group of order three never arises and we're doing okay. So in, you know, in some cases we have mobile dimension three and we, can see what's going on. But this poses numerous other sort of questions. Um, so notice that I gave you verbal dimension two, I gave you various examples of verbal dimension four, I've told you we found examples of verbal dimension three, well what about five and higher? And the answer is we have no examples at all. We don't even have candidates that we failed to do computations in, we just can't think of how this is going to happen. Um, but simultaneously we can't prove that four is the upper bound. It could be that there are no higher dimensional things possible. We just don't know. Um, if you can get bigger than four, okay, well, if four is not the stopping point. Could it be you can't get bigger than five or you can't get bigger than six? Or could it be that your dimension can get arbitrarily large? Can you go on forever? Um, we just don't know. Right, is there a generalized bovel group of bovel dimension greater than two whose order is not divisible by three? So this is a slightly weird thing. So. I mentioned on the previous slide that we have examples of groups of probable dimension three and what goes on with those groups is typically you get stuff powering up to you know c3 cross c3 and so you not, might naively initially conjecture okay well the way to prove what's going on is you uh, first prove that there definitely is a c3 cross c3 in there and then you end up proving that stuff has to power up to that and that obstructs having more interesting probable dimension that nice idea lasts all of about two minutes. When you start looking through Ludo's list of 1,000 of groups of order at most 1,023, you do find examples of groups of global dimension three or four, where the order is not divisible by nine. Um, but in particular, you seem to always have to have order divisible by three. And we can't figure out why. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if this was just an artifact of only looking at small groups, and there probably are um, bovel groups with dimension bigger than two whose order um, is not divisible by three, but we don't know of any examples as things stand. Um, yeah, what other properties can these things have? So um, most talks I give on this subject, I start banging on about things called being, you know, bovel surfaces that are strongly real. Um, so thinking of a Riemann surface or a complex curve as being a sort of super up version of the complex plane. Well, if you teach undergraduates complex variable theory, you realize complex conjugation is an important thing. So if conjugation plays such an important role on the plane, it's natural to ask if you've got a souped up version of the plane, like a complex curve, what's, you know, is there a souped up version of complex conjugation? And it turns out there is. Um, and when you do have such a thing, you say the underlying uh, Riemann surface is uh, real and there's a notion of being strongly real and yes that can carry over to the Bovel surfaces and so there's a whole vast literature about when Bovel surfaces have these additional properties of being strongly real and things and well again if you can do it for Bovel groups 
you, there's natural analogs for these higher dimensional generalized bovine varieties. What's going on with these things? I mean, that's a vast question in itself, um, but there's certainly no time to talk about. So on that note, I'll simply say thank you. We thank you for this wonderful talk, uh, Ben, uh, and for being always uh, on time, <laughs> very British with time. So I would like to ask uh, the, from the audience if they have any question to ask to Dr. Ben Fairben. Um, can I, I know you have blocked the video, but um, can I ask um, something? Yeah. Um, no, no, it is, so you can open it. Uh, I, I oh. have just muted everyone and I closed the cameras. You can open your video. I cannot turn on the video. You can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay. Anyway, no, 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 no. Again, I was just coming down from full screen, and my computer just goes blank for several seconds when you do that. So, you know, the slide okay. up there is just now that it's quicker and easier to flip through them. Okay. So, um, I understand this is an algebraic talk. Therefore, whatever I will say is probably way off base. But um, I, I think much more geometrically. And at the very beginning, you indicated that these objects, these algebraic objects, important and, and interesting as they are, they act on pairs of Riemann surfaces um, and so on. Uh, can I develop uh, some form of feeling, if you want geometric feeling, for, I mean, right, when you have a Fuchsian group, for instance, then you have an idea, it is a discrete subgroup of the PSL to R. Um, so th this acts, let's see, by isom isometries on the hyperbolic plane. So it has a geometric interpretation. Obviously, a group does not have to have a geometric interpretation. But is there any geometric interpretation even for special classes of these Boville groups? Well, as I say, you, you're supposed to think of the three points, the X, the Y, and their product as corresponding to the ramification points that each right. of the complex curves have. Um, so as I say, it does sort of come from thinking about Dezins d'Enfant, um, this whole Belli theorem, Belli theory of thinking about, you know, these green is ramified over at most three points. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, that, I mean, all right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good enough, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, actually, it, I'm tempted to ask a question. Can you hear me, Kyriakos? Can you hear me, Kyriakos? Yes. I think we should mute the microphone, I think, Dr. Melitza. Um, there was a technical problem, I think, with Dr. Melitza. Okay. I, uh, I just, yes. just a moment, because I'm connected on okay. uh, Unfortunately, your voice... Um, I just... Yes. Um, I'm sorry because of these problems. I could not hear from certain point on one device and then I joined to the other and now there was some problem. I just wanted to ask if you, I see that you are doing so some counting, how many groups you have, uh, so on. Do you use some uh, combinatorial techniques uh, in your proofs? Um, not really. <laughs> um, you know, when you're computing, I mean, what is combinatorics? You know, if you're dealing with some finite object, you could think of that as being combinatorial. Mm -hmm. But our algorithms for verifying the vocal mm -hmm. dimensions of small groups but really is just naive scrolling mm -hmm. through possible generating pairs and hoping for the best. Um, mm -hmm. As I say, this you can think of this stuff in terms of disease and font. In other words, cellular embeddings of graphs on surfaces. Um, that is one way of thinking about it. I mean, in the last answer to a question, I name dropped this Belli's theorem. Really, that was a theorem that led Growth and Deke to think, well, what if I look at um, pre-images of what's going on here? Does this give me sort of nice graphs and things? And, you know, so you could argue there is a combinatorial aspect to this. Um, it turns out there's only so much you can do thinking of it in those terms. But, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, I can't be much more combinatorial than that. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Um, do you know why Catanese defined this? 
I mean, uh, I see the definition, you have it on the screen. Um, I know it's not a valid question, um, but if you could, um, I mean, uh, well, why? The, the, the sort of, I ask this for pretty much any definition in math that is not, let's say, one line. And of course, most of them are not. I mean, what did he try? What was he trying to do? Okay, so as I say, Bovell himself wrote this textbook back in the seventies. I think it's literally called Complex Surfaces or something like that. Okay. And in the later chapters, where he starts talking about rigidity and how to get this sort of particularly nice, interesting property into surfaces. Um, he points out certain examples at certain points. And in particular, there's an exercise right at the end of that where he says, if I've got the group C5 cross C5, verify that this, this thing is rigid and it does work in this nice way. And then he literally just throws away his casual remark, find other examples. And so when, Bo, um, when Catanese wrote down this definition, he was literally just trying to generalize what was going on with C5 cross C5. Um, and it turns out the way to do that is to make it make all these nice properties hang around, you know, have the group act in a very particular way and having the projections when you restrict the G to one of the surfaces, you know, projecting onto the, uh, the sphere. Um, yeah, he, he was basically trying to construct rigid examples, generalizing this very certain specific case that Bovell laid down. And when you say deformation, you mean the deformation of the complex structure, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions to Dr. Fairburn? Actually, I'm tempted to ask one question because I'm always trying to find something topological, uh, like Nikos is trying to find something geometrical and like Dr. Militz is trying to find something combinatorial. So uh, I am reading um, that you have an open problem. Actually, you have many open problems in one of your papers, Beauville surfaces, structures, and groups which talks about the orbits of the absolute Galois group. And you're talking about hom non-homeomorphic pairs of the Bovell surfaces. You know, you're asking if you can construct arbitrarily large orbits of the absolute Galois group consisting of mutually non-homeomorphic pairs. Is this problem still open? Um, yes and no. So some stuff along these lines is known. So some of these names at the bottom, so in particular Heikin Zapparin, um, I believe they've done some work where I think it was basically you take groups like PSL2 and PGL2 and try and relate them to each other and they can give you arbitrarily large orbits with interesting properties, but that somehow sort of settles it, but not quite. Um, yeah, because I, I mean, as I say, this tacitly designed on font floating in the background. And the second you've got those is precisely the second you're talking about the absolute Galois group. Um, certainly, there was a long standing problem along the lines of does the absolute Galois group act um, faithfully on, uh, I think it's regular designs or designs of some particular property. And if you look at the paper where that was finally settled after about 40 years, half the paper talks about Povel surfaces. Um, because again, you're quite right, the absolute Galois group, but the sort of deeper, more difficult end of thinking about this stuff, there were questions about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're that interested, I could probably point you in the direction of a couple of papers that talk about this stuff, but um, yeah, I, I'm probably not quite wrong. Right. It looks very interesting question. Is it your question, actually? This is, is this your open question? Um, well, I probably was repeating somebody else's question. I mean, the, I've written various papers that repeat other people's problems and cook up my own problems. Um, because it looks very, very interesting. Actually, you say that the task of understanding the absolute Galois group is of central central importance in algebraic number theory, actually. Something that you, you wouldn't expect. It's uh, because it's related to the inverse Galois problem, you know. It's very interesting, indeed. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what makes the absolute Galois group so interesting. It is basically the whole of algebraic number theory encapsulated in one group. Exactly. So if that's one group, why not think about all groups? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'm wondering, um, again, on the geometric side of things, if you draw a Cayley graph, right, of these things, any idea how they look like? Are they trees? What are they? Because I have to sit down and do it, but um, do you know on top of your head 
some special properties probably or something? That's a good question. You know, if in doubt, you've got a generating set of a group, what's the Cayley graph? You're right, that's a nice thing to ask. Um, uh, but, because I always try to find the intersections between, well, hyperbolic groups is a little bit far-fetched to, to see probably at this stage, but something maybe somewhat related to it in some form. I, I don't... I, I mean, I mean, you're right, you know, if we're in the world of compact Riemann surfaces of genus at least two, then hyperbolic geometry is what's going on in the background, certainly. Right. Um, I mean, the thing is, given a Bobel group, I mean, I guess I wasn't very explicit here. So, I mean, I've said if I have a Bobel, if I have a group that has a Bobel structure, it's a Bobel group. But flipping that the other way around, if I have a Bobel group, note, it will almost certainly have tons of different structures which means, you know, okay. the different generating pairs, you take pairs of those pairs and the number of Cayley graphs you would associate with the probable structures of a group, there's gonna to be tons of them. Um, right, right. And somebody can ask whether there are any common features, right, uh, of some sort. But again, this goes too much on the geometric side of things. So I, I stop right here with the question. Thank you very much. Any other questions to Dr. Fairburn? If there are no other questions, then I would like to thank you, Ben, for, for, thank you. for the pleasure uh, to give thank us such you. a nice talk, such an inspiring talk. And hopefully in the future, you can give us a talk uh, physically after Corona, you know. <laughs> uh, well, greetings to London and uh, from a warm Kuwait and uh, keep in touch. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.